Today, I want to uh, talk a little bit about identity and origin. Um, I think it's a, it's a really dense message, but I feel like it's super important for us to cover this as we go into the school year, um, as we go into uh, what is promotion. Um, so I want to pray for us before we get into it, if that's okay. If we could pray real quick. Father, I pray that you would speak to us today. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill our hearts. Would you shape our minds? Would you cultivate our faith in this very hour? And I pray, Father, that your word would be living and active in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, The reason why I want to talk about identity and origin is a couple things. But the first thing is, um, real quick, can you guys name this movie? The Avengers, okay? You guys know which one? The first, second, third? That's the first one. That's the first one. Okay, Chosen has very strong opinions about the first Avengers. Um, But the last scene, if you guys remember, there's only one thing they have to do to get rid of all of the bad stuff. Okay? There's only one thing they had to do. Same thing with this movie. Do you guys know this movie? It's Endgame. It's still Avengers. But it's the same concept. Okay? Everything looks like everything is going wrong. And all they have to do is take care of this one thing. And all of the bad guys, all of the bad things disappear. The thing with identity and knowing where we come from, it's kind of like those movies, okay? There are certain topics that when we hit it, when we hit it, everything should come into alignment. It's like spiritual chiropractic, okay? Mr. Sung um, is a really good chiropractor. He's worked on my back once and it felt really good, but it's kind of like that. When there are things in our body or things in our spirit that are out of alignment, when we hit that one thing, those other areas of our faith our other areas of our beliefs start coming into alignment. Does that make sense? And understanding your identity and understanding where we come from is one of those things. When we hit it, everything else comes into into alignment, okay? So we're going to talk about um, several different passages, but stay with me. It's going to be a a little bit Bible-heavy, but we'll get there, and it's going to come together nicely in the end, okay? Um, So the first thing is as we get to know who we are and who God is, the first step to getting there is to bring nothing. Bring your nothing, okay? Um, And to understand this passage, we're going to talk about a guy in the Bible named Naaman. Have you guys heard of Naaman? Not Naaman Marcus. My wife was like, we're talking about Naaman Marcus? No, no, no. There's a character in 2 Kings named Naaman, okay? And this is how the passage goes. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. Okay, really important. King of Aram and Israel were not friends. In fact, they were enemies, okay? So, he was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. Okay? I know that's a little bit of a mind twist because Aram is not friends with Israel, and yet it says in the passage that through God's sovereignty, Aram was used by the Lord to bring victory to Aram, okay? He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, the thing about leprosy is that it was a really big deal back then, okay? Remember when we had COVID running rampant all around the world? Anytime you had COVID, you were like avoided and you had to be locked up in a room. Leprosy was kind of the same thing. If you had leprosy at the time, you were not allowed to be a part of society, and you had to be pushed out, okay? So Naaman had leprosy, okay? People who um, are married can relate to this because uh, when you first went on dates, there's probably one part about you that you don't want your, at the time, girlfriend to find out about you. Does that make sense? For me, I had a really big insecurity about my toes, okay? Don't ask to see my toes after service, okay, because I'm not going to show you. But my toes are a little weird. I'll just leave it at that. But when we started dating, that was the one area where we were like, okay, we're going to go to the beach or something. And I was like a little bit cheapish to take off my socks, but uh, we're married now, so it doesn't matter. But leprosy was like that. Leprosy was the one thing you did not want people to find out. So you were covering yourself. You were covering those broken areas to make sure that people wouldn't find out about it, okay? Verse 2, now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken a young girl from Israel. 
and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he will cure him of his leprosy. So this person who was captured by Naaman as an Israelite sees Naaman's leprosy. Somehow she caught a glimpse of it and says he could be healed if he would only go see the person in Israel. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go. The king of Aram replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. Basically meaning he brought everything, like a Ford Mustang and ten thousand bitcoins. I don't know. But he brought a lot of things with him. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter, I'm sending my servant servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Who does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See how he was trying to pick a quarrel with me. So the king thought that Aaron was actually mocking him because they had taken captive of Israel at the time. Okay, let's keep reading. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Has a man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be cleansed. Now the thing about Jordan is that it was not the best body of water. Like, if you're going to be able to go to any beach in the world, like, any beach in the world, any beach, it's not going to be Ocean City, okay? Ocean City, to me, is, like, bottom-tier beach, okay? But that's what the prophet was telling Naaman to do. Go wash yourself in Ocean City, Maryland, in the River of Jordan. And Naaman went away angry because he was a prideful man. He had a lot of things. He had taken victory over several wars. And this was the one thing that Elisha told him to do. Go wash yourself in Ocean City, Maryland. And Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana or Farpar or Outer Banks or Huntington Beach, any of those beaches, the rivers of Damascus, Better than all the waters of Israel. Couldn't I just have washed over there? So he went off in a rage. You see, when you have a lot of things, and you have a lot of good things going for you, the simplest things to obey God become offensive because they don't necessarily align with what you have. A lot of times, God's obedience will be in direct opposition to the things that we hold very, very dearly. And yet those are the things God calls us to do. And you see, the thing about Naaman was that nothing was the one thing he didn't have. He had everything, but he didn't have nothing. And when we come to God, we come with our nothing. That's the first thing. So Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father... If the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. You see, Naaman's servant was like, if he told you to do something like majestic, like blink your eyes 72 times and then dip yourself in like golden water, then you would have probably done it. But because it's so simple, If the obedience of God is so simple, why don't you just do it? You see, God doesn't demand that we do extravagant things. He cares about the little things. God doesn't care about all of the acts of glory and obedience that happen at Transformation Retreat. God cares about your step of obedience on a Tuesday. And on a Wednesday when no one's looking. Or on a Thursday when your parents aren't home and you decide to do dishes. God cares about the simple obedience. Then Naaman and all of his attendees went back to the man of God who stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. 
Please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. So the story of Naaman is this. He's not a Jew. He actually took captive of a Jew. He had leprosy and was healed in Israel. Which is crazy to think about. He was not part of God's holy people. He was not in the nation of Israel. And Naaman had everything, but God wanted his nothing. And yet, in spite of all of this fluctuation, Naaman got healed. Okay, why is this important? Because Jesus references Naaman as well. I don't know if you guys knew this, but Jesus references Naaman one time. And that one time is when Jesus begins his earthly ministry. Okay? So in order to know our identity, the first step is bring your nothing before God. The second step is leave your past. And here's what I mean by that. Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 30. Okay? This one is a little bit long, so we're going to go through this part pretty quickly. Okay? So, and he, being Jesus, came to Nazareth, Nazareth, where he had been brought up. So he was raised up in Nazareth. And he came back, there he was, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue or church on Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, reading the word of God in front of everyone. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Basically saying, everything you study about the Messiah who is coming to restore the kingdom of God is today. It begins today. This is exactly what Jesus was saying. And all spoke well of him and marveled at his gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do you hear in your hometown as well? And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over the land. There's our boy Naaman right there. And Elijah sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of prophet Elisha. And none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things in the synagogue, they were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him off a cliff. Pretty intense, okay? But there's our boy, Naaman, right there, okay? Jesus references Naaman to make a point. Naaman did not belong to the land of Israel. The people who were standing before Jesus in the temple supposedly belonged to God because they were Jews. And Jesus is saying, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. And he's also saying this, just because you are by birth and by heritage a Jew does not mean that you are of God. Because salvation comes through Jesus. The person that was standing before him. Does that make sense? Okay. It's kind of like this. Okay. A lot of people I know, actually even my coworkers, they will say, I'm a Christian. I go to church on Easter and on Christmas and sometimes on a Sunday. There's a problem with that. Okay. I go to Wendy's maybe two times a week sometimes on a good week. Just because I go to Wendy's, I'm not a hamburger. Does that make sense? Just because you go to bubble tea three times a week, you're not a tapioca ball. 
Just because someone says they've gone to church does not make them a Christian. And just because you were born into Israel, according to Jesus, and you were, you were born in the lineage of Abraham, does not mean you belong to God. Because salvation comes from Jesus alone. Which means in order to know who you truly are, you have to leave your past behind too. Everything that you think about yourself, whether you grew up at Hope Church or you've been to VBS 17 times, does not make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is whether or not you know Jesus. So the last thing is this. He said, bring nothing when you come to God. And leave everything in your past when you come to God. And the most important thing is to run to him. Run to God. I heard a pastor say this before, and I think it's pretty funny. A lot of Christians will argue that I can't go to God because I have too much junk going on in my life. Like, I'll come to church. Like, we, Chosen, I don't know if you guys remember this, but we were praying for some lady, and we were inviting her to church, and she said, oh, I'll, I'll come to church when I get my life together. But the whole point is you don't have to get your life together. You run to God, and he gets your life together. Okay? Um, if you're a member of Session and, uh, or Pastor Mimi, if Moses came to our church and brought his resume, would you hire him as a pastor? His resume has, I murdered someone, and I ran away and lived in the desert for several years. I guarantee you, he's not passing our background check. And I guarantee you, you have not been worse than Moses. You have not been worse than David. You have not been worse than Apostle Paul, who was essentially a biblical terrorist at the time before he got saved. And yet all of these people, God found them. In order to know who you are in God, you run to him. When you mess up, when you sin, when you make a mistake, don't clean yourself up and then come to God. Run to him first and he'll clean you up. I am not looking forward to the day when Ronnie wants to do things on his own. Like, I love when he can't walk up the steps. The first person he looks for is me. And he wants me to hold his hand so he can walk up the stairs. When he's old enough, he's not going to do that. He's going to walk up the stairs on his own. I mean, that's good because I don't want an 18-year-old to look for me when he wants to walk up the steps, right? But in your walk with God, he doesn't want you to just be independent all the time. He wants you to hold on to his hand so he can walk you through life. This is what it means to walk with God together. Okay? And here's why origin is important. I heard this passage um, taught at a different church, and it's a little bit heavy. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. For, the, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The first time I said this passage to my wife, she looked at me and she was like, is that from Star Wars? I was like, no, that's from the Bible. It's Ephesians. But this passage is quoted quite a lot when we talk about spiritual warfare. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That word principalities in Greek is arche, which is where we derive the term archaeology or archetype, meaning the first. When I first heard someone say that, I had to look it up myself. And sure enough, I found in many different places here, the definition, a beginning, that word arche is the beginning. An extremely corner and attached cord. First place. Okay? Here's another concordance. Arche. Beginning. An origin. The origin. Think about that. The passage we just read said this. We don't wrestle against people, but we wrestle against principalities or against the origins of life. I don't know if you're tracking with me, but right now, 
for as long as I can remember, the attack has always been on origin. Which is why we talk about Big Bang Theory, which is why we talk about evolution theory, which is why right now people can't figure out whether or not you're a boy or a girl at birth and they don't want to define that, which is why they're trying to go back all the way to the origin because without the absence of God, nothing is defined. Which is why the attack from this world right now is to remove God from the origin. Because if you remove God from the origin, nothing is defined. And if nothing is defined, nothing really matters. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against spiritual forces. Primarily right now, what we're seeing is the origin of life. Which is why in Genesis, I love this passage, it says, in the beginning, God. When we talk about knowing God and walking with God and running to God, it's important to know that God was at the beginning. And if God was at the beginning, he has ultimate authority and say over anything we do. But here's the good thing. He's a good God, so we can trust him. He's a good God, so we can trust him. Okay? I mentioned this, like, I think the first time I joined Chosen, but um, do you guys know what that is? Did you say a jet suit? Oh, a jet ski. That is not a Yeezy. It's like a Jeremy Wang kind of shoe thing. This shoe is over $1,000. Yes, I agree with you, okay? That goes on your shoe. That goes on your foot, okay? Personally, it looks like some sort of like heating iron that I would use to probably unwrinkle some of my clothes. So if I took that shoe, went to the designer and said, hey, I know you made this, but actually, I think this is a heating iron. What would he say to me? He would tell me, I don't care what you think. I made it. I get to define what I made. It doesn't matter what I think. I could use it as a heating iron all I want but it doesn't change what that actual object is, okay? Here's another one. Anyone know what this is? Oh, wow, you guys got it. It is a purse. I was genuinely confused. It looks like a very shiny ball of yarn that was orchestrated together very intricately, but that is a purse. It also looks like spaghetti noodles, in my opinion, okay? But in actuality, it is a purse, a very, very expensive purse. If I took that purse, went to the designer and said, I'm going to make spaghetti out of these purses, that person is not going to care. I get to do whatever I want with it, but ultimately the designer and the creator of whatever object it is get to define the object itself. So as we talk about origin, I hope you guys get where I'm getting with this. Who made you? Who made us? Because ultimately, whoever made us gets to define who we are. And if we remove God from the origin of it, then you won't find out who you are. Which is why the world is guessing. The world is guessing to figure out your identity, and they're telling you to try all of these different things to figure out who you are, and in trying different things, things that are weird, you might figure out who you really are and discover that you have a specific identity. And here's a problem with that. Statistics are coming to show out that the more you do that, the more you lose yourself 10, 15 years later. And people are saying that, well, if you figure this out at a young age, you will become less suicidal and less depressed. And statistics show that 10, 15 years later, that the people who experiment with that have not gotten out of depression or suicidal thoughts. The issue is not that you need to figure out who you are. The issue is you need to figure out who God is. And when you figure out who God is, he will tell you who you are. God gets to define who you are because he made you. Amen? 
there's a few people that I've met over the past few years who are really, really difficult <laughs> to talk to. Because some of them are like talking to a wall. You say one thing, it goes in one ear, out the other, or it just doesn't, like, something is, like, missing connection pieces. You guys know what I mean? There are people that we are called to walk out to by design. And even the way you do missions, even the way we do house church, it's going to happen through design because God is the one who originated it. And God is calling us as the body of Christ to bring people back into that origin, to figure out who they were, who, were, who they were destined to be. And it's going to be in your house churches. It's going to happen in Hope Church. I'm declaring it this year. As we walk out in this academic year, we just had promotion Sunday. We're going to go back to resuming normal activities. Your children won't be around Monday through Friday, like from the hours of 9 to however long. And we're going to have house churches. We're going to have chosen meetings. We're going to gather on Sundays. And I believe that we are going to experience God as the creator. And he's going to give us identity. He's going to give us purpose. And he's going to fill us up. He's going to fill us up to reach other people. And they're going to do the same thing. And they're going to find their destiny in our house. And that's the goal. That's why we do house church. That's why we gather on Sundays. That's why we meet and pray together. If I could have the worship team come up. That last song, I've asked us to close with it because I love it. If you've grown up the way I've grown up, running to God when you make a mistake is not your first instinct. If you've grown up in a house like me where making mistakes was not the best thing to do, running to God is not your first instinct. I love my parents, but we did not grow up in, like, a healthy home at the time, and I see that now. Some of you guys chose, and you guys are growing up in nice homes, but a lot of us didn't. It wasn't okay to make mistakes. And if that translates, and if that's been your experience, where when you make mistakes, you are punished, or you are criticized, Some of you guys were spanked. I'm not saying all spanking is bad, okay? I believe in biblical discipline. Amen. (laughs) But what I'm saying is if you grew up in a home where there was borderline physical abuse, or if you grew up in a home where making mistakes, you weren't met with grace when you made mistakes. And if you think about it, and if that's translating into your relationship with God we need to address that because God is a father who wants us to run to him when he makes mistakes there was one time I was at a Starbucks in Rockville I saw a young girl pull out her car and run into another car while the owner of the other car was standing right there and that lady went up to the driver and I was there for this and the driver of the car was a young high school girl And she started bawling, like crying hysterically. And the lady was like, the person whose car got hit, like she went from angry to sad, like in like the span of 10 seconds. And she was like, what's wrong? And the driver, the young girl said, my dad's going to kill me. My dad's going to kill me. And then the lady, for the next several minutes, was trying to comfort her, letting her know, no, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. This is the person whose car got hit. That's been my experience for a long time growing up. Before I truly knew who God was, every time I messed up, my thought was God's going to kill me or he's going to punish me or he's going to teach me a lesson through another bad thing that's going to happen and I'm going to have to learn how to correct myself. Does that make sense? There are some people, and I know this because they said it, some people when bad things happen, they think it's God trying to teach them a lesson to correct them to be a better person. God does not want us to run away from him when things happen. He wants us to run to him. We 
you got to get this part right. God is our creator. He is our father. Does he teach us and correct us? Yes, he does. But if it's causing you to run from him and not towards him, that's not from God. And if there are things that happen that cause you to run from him, those are things that need to be addressed. But it all starts in knowing your origin. It starts from knowing God was in the beginning and he created you. It starts from knowing who you are in him. Amen. Let's stand. I'm going to pray for us and we'll jump into some worship real quick. Father, I thank you that you've created us from the beginning. God, I thank you, Lord, that you were there at the beginning. You don't have a beginning and you don't have an end. Lord, you created us with a specific purpose. You've created us uniquely. And Father, I pray that right now you would give us the revelation of who you are, that you are a creator God, that you are a loving Father who created us with intent. You didn't create us by mistake. You didn't spin the world and say, let's see what happens. God, you've been intricately involved in our lives from the beginning. And Father, I pray right now for any of us who are struggling to find who we are or to find who you are. We surrender any of those questions to you right now. And we give you permission to define us. The same way anyone who created any object has permission and jurisdiction to define the object they created. Father, we declare that we were created by you and we give you permission to define us the way you've called us to live. We're going to sing a worship song and if that's you, if that resonates with you, um, during worship, engage with the Lord and just surrender to him. And I know for you, that's like, I don't even know what that means. Just start saying it to God. Start saying to Jesus that you give permission for him to define you the way he made you. It's not going to happen immediately. For some of you, it might. Some of you guys, it might be a year-long process. But as you begin this journey of surrendering to the creator, permission to define you, he will begin to do that. And he will begin to reveal to you why you're here in 2024 in Clarksville, Maryland, in a room called The Gathering Place. Why are we here? In one of the wealthiest states all around the world. Why are we here? There must be a purpose because there's a design for it. As we surrender to him, he'll begin to show us. So Father, we ask you to show that to us today. As we enter into a time of worship, Father, I ask that you'll begin to speak to our hearts and define us. Because once you define us, Father, everything changes. Everything changes. And it's only through the blood of Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. One of the things that we do to help us understand our identity is to receive prayer from your community to hear what God says about you through other people because a lot of times God likes speaking to a community of people and not just from one person. And so as we normally do, if you want prayer or ministry, um, I would invite you to come up. But house churches and other ministries, if you see someone from your house church or ministry come up, I would invite you guys to come up and pray with them as well and speak identity into their hearts. And I'm going to close with this story and then I'll do the benediction real quick. One of the best times of outreach I've ever experienced was in Baltimore in the hood and it was crazy I don't know what happened to uh, me and the two other people I was with they saw a blind person with a stick on the other side of the road and it was like 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon so they run across the street and I'm like okay I guess we're going so I run and I catch up to them and there's a blind guy with a walking stick waiting for his bus I didn't have faith to believe that God was going to heal this person at all. Like, I had absolutely none. But the other two people I was with, they just went for it. They are like, hey, we want to pray for you. So we prayed for him. 
Um, he started explaining that he had glau glau glaucoma, and so he couldn't see beyond one or two feet in front of his eyes. So if we held like four fingers in front of his face, if it was two feet, he could see it. Anything beyond that, he couldn't see. And we tested this just to make sure. The first two times we were going for it and we were praying for this person, asking God and believing. Well, I didn't believe. I didn't have enough faith. But my, the other guys there, they were praying and they were believing for his healing and nothing happened at all. And so we were about to walk away completely disappointed and I just felt a nudge in my heart, like a tap on the shoulder saying, hey, tell him who he is. Speak identity into him. So instead of praying for healing, the next round of prayer, I just started praying, hey, this is who God says you are. You're a good man. You're a good man. God has seen some of the things that you've gone through where it was hard for you to make the right choice, but you did it anyway. God sees that. And he says that you're an honorable man. And for the next five minutes, we just start praying for his identity. And then after that, very quickly, I said, God, we pray for his healing of his sight. Instantly, his vision was, was restored five to six feet out. And we tested it in the middle of Baltimore. And I walked away where, where God was saying, I'm interested in healing, but I'm more interested in restoring hearts. I'm interested in restoring identity that the enemy is trying to take away. This is who our God is. This is who our God is. He's in the business of healing. He's in the business of restoring. He's especially in the business of giving us our identity in him. So, Father, I thank you, Jesus, that it's not too difficult for you. And if you've done it before, you'll do it again. If you've healed the blind before, you'll do it again. If you've given restoration to sight and to our hearts before, you will do it again. And so, Father, I'm asking you in this season, Father, that you would restore identity. I'm asking you in this season that you would speak to our hearts and remind us of who we are, remind us of who we belong to, God. And I pray more than ever that you would speak into our hearts a conviction that you are the creator, God, that you created us with good intent, with love in your heart, and with a specific purpose in mind. We love you and we honor you, God. So may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may his face shine on you, and may you see his smile, and his fingerprints all throughout your days this week. In Jesus' name.